Okay, that was a lot. We've learned how to relate load, reliability, and life and bearings so we can select an appropriate bearing out of a catalog, but we're not quite done. There's one more important thing that we need to account for. Early on we talked a little bit about thrust force or axial force. And in all of these calculations we've assumed that we only have radial forces. So we need some way of accounting for thrust force. So let's have a look at some data. This is figure 11-6 from your textbook. And on the horizontal axis here we have a normalized value for the axial force. This is uh, axial or thrust force down here. On the vertical axis, we have what we call the equivalent radial load. That's been normalized using the radial force. So just to clarify what we mean here. So suppose we have a bearing. And instead of having a purely radial force, which would be straight up and down here, suppose instead we have a force that has both a radial component and an axial component. So I'm going to call this uh, F sub t, the total force applied to the bearing. And we can decompose that. This horizontal component, that will be the axial force, and then the vertical component, that will be the radial force. And then here we have the total force. So the idea here is that we can take this total force that has both an axial and radial component, and we can come up with a radial force that's larger than this radial force that will give us the same reliability and life results. So, in other words, say we have another bearing, but instead of having this uh, force that's at an angle, we have another force that is only in the radial direction. And we're going to call that the equivalent radial force. So I've purposely drawn this a little bit longer. It's a little bit larger than the magnitude of this force. So the idea here is that if we have these two bearings, one is subject to this force with combined axial and radial force. And then this bearing is subject to this equivalent radial force. If they are the same bearing, they will last the same amount of time. That's the idea behind the equivalent radial load, or F sub E. I need to define also this capital V that you see here in these normalized terms. That is called the rotation factor. V is equal to 1 if the inner race rotates. V is equal to 1.2 if the outer race rotates. Now, earlier in our discussion, we talked about these two different cases. If the inner race rotates, then that means we have a shaft. The shaft is moving. If the outer race rotates, then that means we have an axle because the component that's going through the inner race is static. So we should ask the question, why is the rotation factor larger when the outer race rotates? And the answer is essentially the rollers or the balls will travel a greater total difference if we have the outer race rotating. So to think about this geometrically, let's look at a cross section of a ball bearing. That's supposed to be the inner race, that's the outer race. Now, as we rotate 
this ball is going to move, let's say we are rotating the outer race. Say if we rotate it n revolutions, then the number of rotations the ball will rotate will actually be larger compared to the case where if we rotate the inner race n revolutions. And that's because the circumference of the inner race is smaller than the circumference of the larger race. So that's the essence of why the rotation factor is larger if the outer race rotates. And that's important to keep in mind. I, that's why I spent a little bit of time on this is because life is going to be short, shorter if we have an axle, if we have the outer race rotating. If everything else is equal, life will be shorter. Okay, let's go back here and have a little closer look at this figure. These circles correspond to failure data for bearings. And as we start out over here, we have no axial force, no thrust force. And so that means the equivalent radial load divided by the radial load, of course, is going to be equal to 1. And it turns out as we increase the axial force or the thrust force, the equivalent radial load actually really doesn't change much until we get to a threshold value that we call E here. So once we cross this line, once the normalized thrust force is larger than E, then the equivalent radial load starts to increase. And so we need to do a couple of things here. If we have a bearing that has a thrust force applied to it, first we need to find out, is the normalized thrust force larger or smaller than E? If it's smaller than E, then we don't have to account for the thrust force. We can just go ahead and go through our, our calculations using only the radial force. But if it's larger than E, then we actually have to do some calculations. We need to figure out, well, where along this line are we? And then figure out what is the equivalent radial load. To quantify this, if the, the normalized axial force is less than E, then the normalized equivalent radial load is equal to 1. And that corresponds to this horizontal, this flat part here. And then if we have uh, the axial force, normalized axial force greater than E, then that's just a little bit more complicated. That means the normalized equivalent radial load then is equal to this formula. So there's this uh, constant part x plus the slope y times the normalized axial force. So there are a couple of things we need to learn how to calculate. We need to know what E is, we need to know what x is, we need to know what y is. So it turns out we can actually look up these quantities in a table. They do require some calculations but uh, they're, they're fairly straightforward to obtain. So if we go to table 1, or sorry, 11-1 in your textbook, this is what we can use to find out what E, X, and Y is. So E, X, and Y. And it turns out that these quantities depend on uh, this value of FA, the axial force, divided by uh, C naught. And C naught is something we call the basic static load rating. The basic static load rating of a bearing is the maximum radial force that a bearing can tolerate without sustaining permanent damage. So that means the bearing's not moving, there's no rotation, and if we apply C naught of force 
to the bearing, it won't deform. But if we apply a force, a radial force, that's just a little bit larger than C0, then we're going to have, have some permanent deformation. So we need to find out what C0 is. And to do that, we have to know what the bearing is. And if we know the axial force and then we know C0, then we can go down this table and find out what E, X1, Y1, or X2, Y2 are. So in this table, we don't have a tremendous number of values, not that many rows. So in most cases, we're going to have to do some interpolation. In most cases, we'll have a value of the axial force divided by the basic static load rating that lies somewhere between these values. So we're going to have to use interpolation to find out what the exact values of E, X, and Y are. So because we need to know what the bearing is to get the value for the basic static load rating, this can be an iterative process. So in other words, the equivalent radial load depends on the basic static load rating, but the basic static load rating depends on bearing selection. And we can't select the bearing until we know what the equivalent radial load is. So the process goes something like this. If we know what the axial force is, then we need to choose an initial bearing, which will give us the basic static load rating. Once we know the basic static load rating, then we can use the formulas that we just went through to calculate the equivalent radial load, which also requires that we use table 11-1 that you can see below. But if the bearing that we select cannot handle the equivalent radial load, we're going to have to repeat the process. That means we need to go back, choose a stronger bearing, we'll get a new value for the basic static load rating. And then we calculate a new value for the equivalent radial load. And ideally, within a very short number of iterations, you converge on a bearing selection.